Praise the Lord. Thank you, Tiffany, and thanks to each and every one of you for worshiping the Lord. And uh, there's a beautiful presence of God here. It's my privilege now to present our general superintendent, Brother David Bernard. Uh, I want to say how much I appreciate him. No doubt we are all aware that he is a very uh, a man that is very prepared, uh, has studied extensively, not in the past, but continues to do that. But I would think for this particular meeting, the experience that he has is he is a missionary kid. In fact, I was thinking uh, about uh, this introduction on the Global Missions Administrative Committee but with us and our wives. There are probably only two other members of our committee that share the position of being a missionary kid, and that's Brother Abernathy and Sister Crosley. But that's a definitely a unique position. I don't know what that's like. But uh, Brother Bernard came from the perspective that it was pioneering, and uh, he observed things in his parents, and I'm sure observed things about the administration of global missions, or at that time it was foreign missions, that would be a good perspective that I do hear sometimes from him. Uh, I don't think necessarily always intentional, but when he talks about his experience in foreign missions in South Korea, and I'd like to say that I appreciate him always being willing to help us in global missions. He always has time. Uh, when I call him, when I need to talk with him, he's always available. And I want to say how very much I appreciate him being here today with us. Brother Bernard, thank you for taking time to be with us. Let's welcome him to this pulpit as he comes to speak to us. Our General Superintendent, Brother David Bernard. Thank you. Please be seated. It's certainly great to be here today. And I think I'm supposed to preach, and I'll probably do a little bit of that. But I will also perhaps share some experiences and perspectives. So uh, first of all, let me say I do appreciate our Global Missions team. They're doing an outstanding job. Uh, amen. Uh, starting with our director, Brother Howell, and I think probably Brother Poitras is uh, directly over this particular meeting. But I've noticed in the last few years some of the meetings with the next steps, with the associates in missions, and so forth. Uh, it's a, a great opportunity to connect with our own constituency domestically and encourage missions for the future. And so I commend the Global Missions team for that strategy, not just short-term, but long-term. Uh, of course, we expect the Lord to come soon, but we must prepare. We don't know uh, how long he will delay his coming. If he waits another hundred years, that's a blink of an eye as far as he's concerned. For most of us, that's beyond our expected uh, lifetime. So we have to plan for the indefinite future here, uh, and it's a both-and strategy. It's not an either-or. We, we seek to reap a rapid harvest, and we pour resources into places where there's the most productivity, but at the same time, we plow the ground and we sow the seed for uh, things that may not seem productive, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, if the Lord tarries, who knows? And so it's worth it even in the most difficult areas uh, because you never know how God will open doors. For example, Iraq was, uh, was one of the hardest places in the world, and I guess it still is now, but there was a window of opportunity uh, where things opened up, and we were able to, to connect with thousands of believers there. So you never know when we will have a window of opportunity. I appreciate your involvement. I believe this is really something that should be a lifelong burden and calling, even if you don't end up being a global missionary the rest of your life. I think the experiences that you have with the Associates and Missions program will give you a different perspective for the rest of your life. And uh, you will be more sensitive to the needs right around here. Really, as far as God is concerned, the field is the world. For administrative purposes, we, we divide it up. But a burden for souls and a burden for diversity, people who are not like us, that is important right here in the U.S. and Canada as well as overseas. And I know when our, my parents traveled on their uh, deputation, uh, they always ministered to the needs of the local church. And typically, uh, both of my parents were credentialed ministers, so typically my dad would take the first half and talk about Korea and the revival there and cast the vision for why we need support. And then my mom would wrap up with an evangelistic appeal, and she would appeal for people to 
um, receive the Holy Ghost, but more than that, to be called to missions, called to intercessory prayer, called to give, called to ministry. And whenever I travel, uh, I meet people all the time who either were converted or received a call to preach or received a call to missions under my parents' ministry. And most of those people didn't end up in Korea, which was their specific area of burden, but by casting the vision and uh, the burden for souls, then, of course, that reaped a harvest uh, for, for around the world. And so I want to talk to you a little bit today about that. And I'm not going to ask you to, um, to stand again, but I'm going to read a few verses from the crucifixion account of Jesus and point out something that I think is interesting, and then, then I'll probably share mostly my own experiences. But if you go to Luke 23, and I've, I've got the New King James open here uh, on my iPad, so I'm just going to stick with that. In Luke 23, 39 through 43, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing, that, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, I chose this one brief excerpt from the crucifixion story, and I want to share some other points in the same story. But I chose this one because just from an outside perspective, you would think, this person, this repentant thief, was the least likely candidate for salvation. It was, he was the least deserving, living his whole life in sin, reaping all the benefits of sin, and the last possible moment when he, when he couldn't do anything else anyway, he, oh yeah, he'd like to repent. And then it would be the least convenient moment. Jesus has spent his whole life in ministry. Now he's dying. He's gasping for breath. It's an agony just to speak. He shouldn't be bothered at the supreme moment of saving the whole world. Uh, why should he care about someone who obviously has no qualifications? But I picked that account, and the title I'll give is The Savior of Outsiders. Because Jesus specializes in reaching for those who are considered the outsiders. And of course, I think this is supremely important for those of us in missions and those of us in AIM. I presume you already have a burden or you wouldn't even be here. But I think we need to be, be very clear about our burden. And that is, if you have a call to missions, you have a call to souls. And if you have a call to souls, it doesn't matter who they are, what color their skin is, what language they speak, what kind of sinful lifestyle they might be involved in, your mission is to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is our example. If you look at the, at the, the account um, of the crucifixion and the, the, the moments leading up to it, it, it seems more than a coincidence. But remember that... Um, Pilate felt bad about condemning Jesus, so he tried to use the custom of the time. Well, I'm supposed to release one, one convicted felon. Um, so I have this man named Barabbas who has terrorized the whole community. He's killed. He's robbed. He's rebelled against the government, tr tried to destroy everything. I could release him, or I could release this man, Jesus, who's gone around doing miracles and teaching and feeding the 5,000. So which would you like? It seemed like a no-brainer, and they chose Barabbas. Barabbas literally means son of the father. That was probably his nickname. He was known as son of the father. But in the plan of God, was it a coincidence that the true son of the father died in place of the rebellious son of the father? His very crucifixion was an example Jesus is here not to save the so-called good people. 
Jesus is saved to take the place. Jesus has died to take the place of the worst. And then on the way to the, to the crucifixion, you know how that Jesus fell underneath the cross and, and the Roman soldiers just grabbed some out of the crowd. Simon of Cyrene, that's North Africa. We don't really know his race. It's very possible he was of a different race um, because he was a North African. Um, but in any event, he was a stranger to, to Jerusalem. And uh, we don't know the rest of the story, but Mark talks about his names, his sons. Well, why would Mark bother to do that unless that was significant to his first century audience? We, we can't say for sure, but I think it's very likely that Simon and his family ended up in the church. And maybe by the time Mark wrote his gospel, Simon had passed away, but, but Mark said, oh, this was Simon, you know, the, the father of Alexander and Rufus as a point of identification. Wouldn't that be an amazing story? If here is literally this stranger from another continent, maybe even another race, and he's just picked out randomly from the crowd to bear the cross of Jesus. But in that very act, he must have seen something in the face of Jesus and felt something in the presence of Jesus. We're not talking about um, uh, a crusade or a door knocking campaign, but in his agony, Jesus was a witness. He was a soul winner. His very presence somehow communicated, you want to know more about this person. At his worst, he was communicating there's something special. And of course, that's really what a soul winner has to be. It's more than eloquence of speech and a smooth presentation to someone. It's lifestyle evangelism. It's very likely that that event caused Simon and his family to become Christians. They entered into the church at some point. And then, of course, you could, you could go through the story of the repentant thief. That in itself is amazing. Then the Gospels also record there was a Roman centurion. The, the captain, the Roman army officer, who was the head of the band that actually crucified Jesus. And when Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, God doesn't forgive people apart from their own faith and repentance. But the prayer of Jesus was designed for God's grace to go forward to lead people to repentance. I think it was fulfilled literally. Because while the religious leaders of the day were mocking Jesus, here was this pagan Roman army officer saying, Truly, this man was the Son of God. And I don't know what he could have known and what he meant by that phrase, but he realized he was in the presence of the divine. While the religious leaders are saying, this guy deserves to die. He's a blasphemer. We, we'd rather have uh, a, a criminal or murderer roaming the streets than this guy. And while he was being rejected by the multitudes and by the people of God, here is a pagan saying, no, wait a minute. I've never encountered this before, truly. I'm in the presence of the divine. He's the Son of God. And again, I don't know the rest of the story. It's very possible, of course, when the, the gospel writer is recorded, it's by inspiration, so God could have given them special revelation. But when you read the gospels, the impression you get is not that they went into their room in a trance and God just revealed all the events to them. The impression you get is they went and interviewed people. If you read the first few verses of Luke, he even tells you, I went around and collected all the material I could about Jesus. Uh, and so you get the impression that they had talked to eyewitnesses and wrote down what they found out. And, of course, divine inspiration would guarantee that what they wrote down is true and accurate, but it didn't take the place of them actually doing the research and the, hearing the testimonies. And so again, we don't know for sure, but how would the gospel writers even know that that Roman centurion said that? They weren't there. All the, all the apostles had fled unless he himself followed up on that 
revelation and somehow became connected to the church and was able to share his testimony. So I'm just sharing for a few minutes. Isn't it amazing? Jesus, our example, our Lord, our Master, our Savior, he was the ultimate Savior of outsiders. And it's no coincidence that the gospel writers picked stories of all the stories they could have picked. They said, I want you to know the kind of people Jesus saves, he saves, you know, he'll take the place of the worst criminal and give them a second chance. When he's falling down beneath the way of the cross, he's at the same time reaching out to touch a man from another continent who's visiting town. And while he's dying on the cross, he reaches over to someone else who's dying and he offers forgiveness to them. And at the moment of death, he's praying for his persecutors and God honors that prayer and touches a Roman army officer, the the, the, the pagan conquerors, the occupying enemy. And so everywhere around you, him, Jesus is saving outsiders. How can we do less? And so I think the whole purpose of missions and the AIM program, and as I said, not only just when you go to another country, but in your home church, when you come back, you should be the advocate of the outsider. If there's a visitor who comes of another race, another color, another language, and nobody else knows who they are, and nobody invites them to lunch, maybe you should be the one to make the connection. Jesus was the Savior of the outsiders. If you have a missions burden, that means you're going to be sensitive to the people who are not like you. You're going to be sensitive to opportunities, whether at home or abroad, to 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 go out of your comfort zone, to expand the kingdom, not just to maintain. And, of course, maintenance is good and necessary, but it's not sufficient. We've got to be at the cutting edge of pushing beyond. Jesus, the Savior of outsiders. So I believe the AIM program is important because it is certainly a force for missions. It supplements our permanent force. It becomes a training ground for future uh, missionaries. But also, it becomes a conscience for the North American church. Because if you truly uh, accept the AIM opportunity, you will be a changed person. You'll have a different perspective. You'll look at things different. And that's the church needs that witness, especially in our multicultural society. You know, I'm an American citizen. I love the uniqueness of our country. Um, and so I am troubled. I, I think we ought to have an immigration policy that makes sense for our nation, and I don't think we should destroy our culture, our economy, our political system. You know, I, we, we're, we believe in freedom of religion, democracy, economic opportunity, and we, we should have an, a, a, an immigration policy that preserves that. But having said that, my politics don't matter when it comes to saving souls. So if they're immigrants, legal or not legal, my job is to reach them. If they're illegal, I'd rather to be saved, and then we can figure out what to do with them. <laughs> them to then to become a Jehovah's Witness or a career criminal or whatever else. <laughs> <laughs> We're always going to be better off seeing people saved, no matter where they are. And, of course, from God's perspective, really, uh, you know, there are no boundaries and borders. I'm not saying our country is not important. I've just said the opposite. But I'm saying from a spiritual point of view, we transcend any earthly considerations. When it comes to winning souls, we got to win souls. So I see the AIM program is not only benefiting global missions, but I see it bringing new and needed perspective and experience to the very issues we face here in the U.S. and Canada. You know, as Brother Howell mentioned, I was raised in Korea. I went there when I was eight. I came back when I was 17 to go to college. At that time, Korea was a very poor third world country. So that was an experience in itself. Then Korean culture is Asian. Um, and so it's completely opposite. M most of the things that you, we as Westerners would think, the Koreans would tend to think the opposite. And so it's about as, as different as you could possibly be. Now, I love Spanish, 
I've picked up a few words here and there. When I was a pastor, probably one-fourth of our congregation were Hispanic, so I love to move in Hispanic culture. But when you're speaking or listening in Spanish, you still have a pretty good background of vocabulary, and many things can be translated word for word or sentence for sentence or phrase for phrase. You know where they're coming from. You have some concept. You, you might have to study Roman Catholicism to, to get the background, but you, you feel like you know where they're coming from and so forth. When you go to a place like Korea, the verb is at the end of the sentence. You don't even know what they're going to say until after they finish. Like if I'm speaking in Spanish, if I can say, I'm going, if I'm seeing English, say, I'm going, and they can translate that. Then I can say to church, and they can translate that. In Korean, you can't say that. If you say, I'm going, they're going to say, where are you going? Well, just translate, I'm going. So we can't say that. We have to know where you're going before we know what to say. So my point is, it's, it's a minor illustration, but the way they think is totally opposite. So you can't get by just translating what you would do in, in the U.S., and doing the same thing in Korea. You could actually uh, mess things up. You know, If you do like this, what does that mean? That means come here. And so if you say, bye-bye, God bless you, good to see you, and they all start coming, well, what's going on? <laughs> That's like in Bulgaria. They say this was because of, uh, I'm not sure, they say it's because of Turkish rule, but for 500 years the Muslims ruled Bulgaria. And so many of them were forced to either convert or be killed. And so they developed, they say, that in Bulgarian, when you want to say yes, you do this. And when you want to say no, you do this. And they said what would happen is the Turks would grab them and say, do you believe Muhammad is the prophet of God? And they would do that and say, okay, let him go. Uh, but in there, and so... Here I am talking to these Bulgarian ministers trying to convince them of the oneness of God. And they're, <laughs> I'm thinking, what else could I say? Well, <laughs> you know, here's Deuteronomy 6 4, here's Colossians 2 9, here's John 20 28, here's, and the more I go, the more. <laughs> and finally, the interpreter explained, they're with you, brother Bernard, they believe it. <laughs> So when I grew up in Korea, I had to learn how to function as a Korean. I, I'm what you call a third culture kid. And uh, so this is, this is what happens. I go to Korea, and of course things have changed now, but I can speak Korean. I can eat Korean food. I, I know what the rules are when you jaywalk or when you, um, you know, give a greeting or when you accept thanks or you know, I know what's the appropriate. Well, then I come here in the U.S., the rules are completely different. So you just switch from one set to the other. Um, but then you kind of look above both, and you can see, you know, some things the Koreans do are a lot better than what Americans do. And like their respect for older people. Now that I have gray hair, if I go to Korea or I meet a Korean, I'm automatically an honored person no matter what. And what I say is very important. And, uh, but then some things I look at Korean custom and I say, you know, I, I just don't really like that. Um, they eat dogs sometimes in the summertime. Um, one of their snacks, we, we have roasted peanuts, they have roasted silkworms. Now, I've eaten roasted silkworms. They're you know, they're, you can take it or leave it, but the consistency is, <laughs> is kind of uh, something to be desired. The exterior crunchy part's okay, but the interior. <laughs> this is right before lunch, so I'll, I'll have to redeem myself. I never knowingly ate dog, but I found out later that we were served dog, and um, it was supposed to be lamb, they said, but after it was over, one of the preachers said, um, lambs don't have bones like that, uh, <laughs> and sure enough, we found out it was, it was dog. Uh, that was actually in Italy, by the way, in Sicily, <laughs> and the, and the uh, 
and the restaurant was raided shortly thereafter and shut down for illegally serving dog meat in, under the guise of lamb. So anyway, so there's some things about other cultures we don't like. But the third culture person says, you know, I respect my home culture, and I respect other cultures. I see the good in different cultures. I see the bad in different cultures. But, but I'm going to forge my own course, and uh, sometimes that's challenging. But it does give you a versatility in ministry. Uh, you know, I have the experience. Some of you have had it. But growing up, uh, it was not uncommon for me to be the only white person in the whole place. I get on a bus with 100 Koreans. I'm the only white person. I stick out. I'm noticeable. I'm different. Especially uh, back in those days when there weren't too many Americans and those who were were soldiers, which don't always leave a good reputation in the community, sad to say. But, um, and so I'd you know, go down the street walking to school and have 50 Korean kids following me because they want to see the American. They've never seen an American white person before. And uh, sometimes they'd even come up and, you know, try to feel our face or feel our hand. Uh, of course, they wouldn't have any idea that we would understand Korean, so they would make comments about us. And I remember my dad one time, he had to take the overnight train. And so he was sitting there at night in the train and overnight, and uh, there are two young ladies right next to him, and uh, they started talking about him. I said, these Americans, they have lots of fur on their face. They, they just grow all kinds of fur. Because, you know, a Korean can go for a week or two without shaving, and, and you wouldn't know it. You know? So my dad didn't say anything. He just went back to the restroom. He had his portable shaver. He shaved. He came back. He sat down. And he says, do I look better now in, in, <laughs> in Korean? <laughs> of course, they were embarrassed. But... Um, we had an Af African-American soldier that we took uh, to one of the country towns. They'd never seen a black person in their whole life. And they were literally coming up trying to rub his skin to see if, if this rubs off <laughs> because they had no comprehension. So I know what it's like to be the center of attention when you don't necessarily want to be the center of attention. And, uh, and so that gives you a little more empathy for other people. And also gives me a comfort. I can walk in any crowd and I feel at home. I'm not going to be intimidated if I'm the only white person uh, or the only American or the only English speaker because you know, I'm used to it. It's pretty much normal for me. Um, talk, uh, Korea's in the news right now because of uh, the tension. That's always been there. It's just escalated because of nuclear weapons. But the capital city of Seoul is about 30 miles from the demilitarized zone. So communist North Korea has artillery that's capable of reaching the city. So nuclear weapons or no nuclear weapons, if war breaks out, they can pretty much destroy the city and kill hundreds of thousands of people before you can do anything. You could kill all their leaders, but they could have fired those artillery shells and their planes could have bombed. It takes, you know, two minutes for their planes to come across the border. And um, so growing up, we had interesting experiences. Um, one of my um, uh, teachers in school, his mother, they, they had been missionaries. And so during the Korean War, when the communists came down through the South, conquered, they went to the door of their house, and his mother opened the door, and the communists just shot her dead on the spot. They... They were going around to the houses of foreigners and so forth. And so when you hear that story, which uh, happened not that far in the past from when we were living there, and then you wake up in the morning, go outside, and there's a communist leaflet in your backyard. Somebody had to put it there, and somebody knew who you were. And then you hear in the news that the communists have shot down a U.S. plane or they've captured a U.S. ship or... One time, um, the communist spies had infiltrated. The, uh, 31 spies uh, came with the goal of assassinating the president. They got all the way downtown in front of the presidential palace when they were discovered, and there was a mass shootout downtown. 
and the survivors escaped through the sewers and were popping up all over town trying to find a way to get out, including the neighborhood of our church. And our church was commandeered as police headquarters uh, to try to capture those spies. And one of them was in the neighborhood, got up on the roofs and was trying to get away on the rooftops, fell in the house, killed the person, and, and was killed by the police. So when that happens in your neighborhood, you know, you have a diff different perspective on life. Uh, you know, when the, your school says they send home a paper saying, in case of invasion, we will get all the kids and we'll march them to the airport. So meet at the airport. Or if you want to, here's the escape route. If you're able to follow that route and pick up your kid in route, fine. But if you can't make it, we'll meet at the airport. And if you're not there, we're going to put your kid on a plane and send them off. Now, that was the... That was the strategy, you know, um, is to, and so that, that puts a different perspective on things. And also, Korea being a third world country, it's a humbling experience. We, we lived in a modest home by American standards. It was very nice for Korean standards at that time because our friends lived in one or two rooms. Um, I remember a man who worked for our family, helped do yard work, things like that. His entire house was smaller than my bedroom. He did not have indoor plumbing. He did not have indoor kitchen. He just had one little room for his whole family to sleep in that was smaller than my bedroom of my modest-sized American-style home. So that puts a different perspective on it as well when you realize that you're privileged in the natural as well as in the spiritual. And it gives you a perspective of... You know, I'm really no better than this other person, so I'm privileged. So instead of looking at the risk, you look at the opportunity. Yes, there are risks, and maybe there are higher in some settings than others. And of course, that's when you have to hear from God. You have to feel like you know from the Lord. I remember, of course, I've never been actually on the AIM program, but I've taken over 100 missions trips of a week or more, so if you just multiply that out, I think I should be given an honorary AIM appointment for <laughs> spending at least two years on the mission field. Uh, but I did a lot of trips before the fall of communism into, and, and even still, some communist countries. So I won't tell any current stories because I still would like to go back to some of those countries, and I don't want to name any names that would get me in trouble. Uh, but... I know years ago in Eastern Europe, I traveled in those communist countries, and so we had to, uh, to be very secretive, meet in homes, and my style of ministry, you couldn't do, you did, couldn't do crusades, but you could teach, and uh, so I had written some books, and they were translated, and, and so you could distribute books secretly, and you could meet with leaders and train the leaders, and then the leaders could in turn uh, go throughout the country, so... It was very productive. I remember before I went on one trip, Brother Harry Sism, who was the director of foreign missions at the time, he says, well, Brother Bernard, I'm so glad you're going on the trip. It's so needed. He said, you know, it's a good thing. You have a ministry like the Apostle Paul. He said, that way, if they throw you in jail, you should just keep writing. Your ministry <laughs> won't suffer. I said, thank you, Brother Sism, for that wonderful encouragement. And I did end up in a few situations. One, I remember we were traveling with Brother Balsa, heading back out of, of Hungary, back to Austria, and Hungary was still communist, and it was late at night. We were traveling home after service, and um, we were carrying some letters that we shouldn't have been carrying and uh, for, for people. It was nothing evil, but we had some letters. Well, we crossed the border. They decided to interrogate us. And they decided to search our car. They, they found these letters. So then they wanted to know, who are these people? And how do you know them? And why are you writing to them? So they put Brother Balsa in one place to interrogate him, put me in another place to interrogate me so they could try to trip us up. Well, they spoke Hungarian and German. Brother Balsa could speak German. He speaks about six different languages. So 
they interrogated him just fine. But when they came to me, I couldn't speak Hungarian or German. I could speak English, I could speak Korean, I could speak a little French, but not Hungarian or German. So after some time of frustration, they brought Brother Balsa over to interpret for me, and so they interrogated me through Brother Balsa. <laughs> and after about 10 or 15 minutes, the guy doing the interrogation, trying his best to intimidate us, trip us up, catch us, he just burst out laughing. And he just waved us on. There's no way that we were going to get caught with Brother Balsa being my interpreter. <laughs> so we escaped. So the Lord, the Lord protects. I remember one time I went into Bulgaria. I was by myself. Uh, since I'd already gone with Brother Balsa, he felt like I knew the ropes so I could just go by myself and... I had the Bulgarian language manuscript of my book, The New Birth. It had been translated, printed in uh, loosely form, and so I was going to take it in the country. And they had um, copy machines, which they, those were strictly reg regulated by the government, but somehow they'd gotten a hold of some copy machines, and so they were going to copy it off and you know, distribute it throughout the country illegally. So obviously I didn't want to disclose that I had this manuscript. So I go through customs as a, a typical American tourist, although they're probably wondering why would an American tourist go to Bulgaria. Um, and so they decide to search me. And I had a briefcase with three pockets, and the manuscript was in the third and final pocket. So I'm mentally rehearsing as they open the briefcase, what am I supposed to say when they pull out this manuscript? It's written in Bulgarian. And they ask, what are you doing with this? Do you read Bulgarian? Who are you going to give this to? You know, you know, I don't want to lie because I'm a Christian, but I don't really want to say, well, I'm, you know, there are 50 house churches I'm working with. I'm going to be distributing them. <laughs> you know, I don't really want to say that either. <laughs> so what is the right answer? So I prayed, God, give me the right words to say. So they opened the first pocket, took everything out, looked at it, the guy just stuck his hand in the second pocket, felt around. And the moment of truth comes, I'm getting ready to say, "Give God, give me words to say. And he just closes the briefcase without looking in the third pocket, weighs me on. So I could tell stories like this all day. Uh, but just to let you know, you do, you, need, you do need to have God on your side. You shouldn't take it for granted. Even though you're going to do God's work, you need to go in the will of God. And then whatever you face, you'll have confidence that everything's going to be all right. It's in God's hands. God's in control. And then when you go, of course, you go to minister, not to be ministered to. You don't go to complain about the showers not being hot. Do your best. If you can find a hot shower, that's great. And if you're in a country that has great amenities, well, fine. Uh, but you're going to serve, not to, to be served. It's not about your comfort or your ministry. It's about the souls, the outsiders. And then when you come back, your ministry has just begun because it needs to change your whole life. It needs to change your support for missions overseas, but it also needs to change your burden for at home. Because remember, Jesus is the Savior of the outsiders. He loves the person that's the one lost sheep. He loves the 99, but he loves that last one. And so I hope that you will have a genuine sensitivity, no matter where you go and no matter where your home is, that Jesus is the Savior of the outsider, the different race, different nationality, different re religious background, different lifestyle, whether, whatever the sin may be. Jesus would want you to reach in whatever way you can for that person. Treat him as a child of God. Treat him as a child of God by creation, if nothing else, and someone for whom Jesus Christ died. And if you do that, you'll be successful. If you love people, even if you're going to a place where you don't speak the language, you can make a difference. If you love people, you have a servant's heart. And if you remember, Jesus is the Savior of the outsider, which is a good thing because when you go on the aim, you're the outsider. So Jesus still loves you too. <laughs>
So I hope I've just shared a few things to encourage you today. Um, God bless you, and uh, let's have revival. Let's win souls for the kingdom of God.